Hello and welcome. Tonight, police in Ebony State arrest suspects over attacks on their stations and parts of the state capital on Tuesday to enforce a sit-at-home order by pro-Biafra agitators. Former governor of Zamfara State defends his proposal to the president to explore dialogue with bandits and resolving insecurity in the northwest. Arawa youth leader says Senator Yerima's suggestion is faulty. Supreme Court nullifies conviction of Senator Peter Mwobushi and his seven-year jail term for 80 million naira fraud orders his immediate release from the correctional center. And United States announces plan to send cluster munition package to Ukraine to boost the country's counteroffensive against Russia. On sports news tonight, Heartland FC beat Carnot Pillars in the final of the Nigerian National League Super 8 playoff to emerge the 2022-23 season champions. And from the nation's capital, some operators in the nation's power sector kick against planned move by the federal government to import electricity meters into the country. Say action will cripple local meter manufacturing. We begin with security in a Boeing state where police authorities have arrested persons they say are responsible for shootings in parts of the state on Tuesday. Parading the suspects at the command headquarters in Abakalike, the state capital, the commissioner of police explains that his men apprehended 15 suspects, including a herbalist who prepares charms for the gunmen. Some of the gunmen were also said to have invaded parts of Abakalike, shooting sporadically to enforce a sit-at-home order by pro-Biafra agitators. Nigeria's southeast region has been volatile for some time, arising from acts of terrorism by non-state actors. Recently, news broke across the southeast region of a sit-at-home order by a group said to be a faction of the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB. Following the panic and apprehension created in Abia, Imo, Anambra, Inugu and Ebony states by the enforcers of the order, the acting inspector general of police ordered that the security be beefed up across the zone with complementary efforts by the military. The police are brought. Go to work on Mondays. As part of the countermeasure, some residents of Orca, the Anambra state capital, troop out in a joint patrol across the city with security operatives to allay the fears of the people. There's no market store. You cannot accuse him of doing this for any selfish material. In Imo and Abia states, the situation is no different. Residents were seen on the streets, markets, petrol stations and financial institutions. If they continue, one day they'll come and say for one year nobody should come out. And that will happen. Because it's, it's an individual in, sitting in his house, announcing this thing and put it in a, in a social media. Let them come out face to face. So as a matter of fact, it is not order. It is disordered by them. And we don't want to compromise with it. We don't want to listen to it. Over the months, the sit-at-home enforcers had attacked police stations in Enugu State, killing police officers. This time, their encounter with gunmen around one day area along Agbani Road met with strict resistance, leaving four dead and arms recovered. In Ebony State, gunmen came out to enforce the order. They burnt down a police patrol vehicle and opened fire on traders and other residents of Sheke and Ukwachi suburbs of Abakaliki, the Ebony State capital. But the police swiftly took the fight to the den of the attackers. Fifteen of them have been apprehended, even with their herbalist. You can see the, the, the blood. You can see the red clothes they were wearing that day. You can see all their paraphernalia. This also includes the women. They were preparing for another attack today when we carry out the strange operation and arrested them. No single person who has given me information has come out that the information leaked and they are after them. Nobody. So let them have confidence. Even in the commission of police that are coming. And all my men, we are honorable person in the state. 
the light of this renewed offensive by security operatives on the activities of these non-state actors, the residents are calling on the various state governments in the region to complement the efforts of the security operatives with actions to ensure a more secure environment. Up north in Zamfara State, troops of Operation Hadar in Daji today rescued 24 kidnapped victims in the Kabugu Lamba area, Maru Loku government of Zamfara. Following intelligence reports on bandits' hideouts in Kabugu Lamba forest, the troops responded with a fighting patrol to the general area. According to a top military source, on reaching the general area, heavy firefights ensued between the bandits and the troops, which lasted for hours, with the bandits fleeing and abandoning the kidnapped victims in the camp. He said four of the armed bandits were neutralized. Among the rescued kidnapped victims are nine women, 14 men and an infant. Let's go now to legal matters. The Supreme Court has upturned the conviction of Senator Peter Mwobushi, who represented Delta North in the 9th National Assembly and his sentence into seven years imprisonment for fraud and money laundering offences. The Apex Court ordered his immediate release from Ikoi Prison in Lagos, where he's currently being held. Delivering judgment, the court also freed the two companies that were tried with him on a two-count charge brought against them by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. In a split decision of four to one, the Supreme Court set aside the July 1st, 2022 judgment of the Court of Appeal, Lagos, which had reversed their discharge and acquittal by a federal high court in Lagos. In a lead judgment by Justice Emmanuel Agim, the Apex Court held that Senator Mwobushi and the two companies were unjustly and maliciously prosecuted by the EFCC for committing no offences known to law and subjected them to criminal trial in relation to civil transaction needlessly. The EFCC had accused Mwobushi and his companies of illegally acquiring a property named Guinea House on Marine Road in Apapa, Lagos for 805 million naira, a property set to belong to the Delta State Government. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has dismissed an appeal brought before it by a governorship aspirant in Delta State, Mr. E.K. Aguaria Norway, seeking the disqualification of Delta State Governor Sheriff Oboriwari for lacking in merit. Mr. Aguaria Norway had in October 2022 taken Mr. Oboriwari and the People's Democratic Party PDP to court, alleging that the former submitted false documents to INEC to aid his qualification for the 2019 House of Assembly election in Delta State. In a unanimous judgment delivered by Justice Emmanuel Agim, the court held that the appellant failed to prove his case beyond reasonable doubt, maintaining that the mere fact that there were differentials in names does not amount to falsity. He adds that an error in date of birth in a certificate not shown evidentially to emanate from the respondent cannot amount to falsity. In dismissing the appeal for lacking in merits, the court ordered the appellant to pay three million naira each as costs to the PDP and the governor. This comes a day after elect the election tribunal upheld the victory of Governor Overy Wari in the 2023 Delta State Governorship poll. Away from the courts, the People's Democratic Party in Benue State has condemned what it claims is the continuous detention of four out of 23 council chairmen recently suspended by Governor Hyacinth Alia. The state publicity secretary of the opposition party in the state is calling on the governor and the DSS to charge the suspended council chairman to court if they have any case to answer or release them. But the governor's chief press secretary, Mr. Terso Kula, denies the arrest, stating that the governor has no hand in their ordeal. Since the meeting Governor Hyacinth Alia had with the 23 local government chairmen elected during the administration of former Governor Samuel Otom of the People's Democratic Party, there have been allegations and counter-allegations by members of both parties on the management of local government funds. 
The opposition PDP also believes the APC administration, led by Reverend Father Hyacinth Alia, is determined to persecute its members, as four out of the 23 suspended chairmen, including an 82-year-old chairman of the Shonga local government area, Mrs. Victoria Gajir, have been in detention since Monday, July the 3rd, and the PDP is pointing accusing fingers. On Monday, 3rd July, 2023, the executive chairman of Guma, Katsina Allah, Ushongo, and other local government areas had honored an invitation from the Directorate of State Service, DSS in Makodi, on the prompting of the governor, and since then, they have been under detention there. Today marks over 72 hours of the detention of the council chairman by DSS without stating what their offense is or charging them to court, in the face of which it is plausible to infer that their offense could only be a refusal to surrender to the illegality of their purported suspension from office under the orders of Governor Alia. However, the chief press secretary to Governor Alia denied the allegations. Instead, he gives an update on the status of the 23 local government areas. To be sincere, I'm not aware that a chairman is arrested and detained in the first place. But we saw our authority, I'm hearing for the first time from you that the DSS picked a chairman. Okay, four chairman. Uh, Excellency has never ordered arrest of anybody, as far as I know. And I doubt whether he's even aware that any chairman has been picked or detained or incarcerated, as you put it. Over time, it has become somewhat of a tradition for Benue politics to be plagued by deep horse trading between the ruling and opposition parties. But what is key is that these parties do not lose sight of good governance in the interest of the people of Benue state. To education matters, adequate funding at the local government level is pivotal to helping Nigeria solve the issue of out-of-school children, thereby bridging a gap between public and private schools. That's the view of former Commissioner for Education in Lagos State, Mrs. Falashade Adifisayo, at the Africa Leadership Group series convened by Pastor Itua Igodalo. The group is a platform created for like minds to discuss good governance, accountability and address the leadership dilemma on the African continent. Mrs. Adifusayo, an educationist, believes that these issues can be resolved if the constitutional requirements are adhered to for education to thrive at both state and local government levels. I think it's a question of us again looking at that concurrent list and saying what other things can we push so that we increase the income of local governments, but on the other hand, how do we strengthen the local governments? I'm a great proponent of local governments being in charge of primary schools because there are local schools in their community and they understand their community. But they are so poorly funded and so poorly run. There are low hanging fruits and there are long term things that we need to do. The long term would be constitutional reforms, the long term things would be, you know, things like even the managing the bureaucracy, how do we manage the bureaucracy? The short-term things would be the things that I think we should do immediately. Uh, technology is going to be a great, great accelerator. There's, there, some people have done the maths and found that we need 100,000 classrooms. There's no way we are going to build 100,000 classrooms in the next uh, 50 years. So then we will continue to have these children out of school. But technology is a, it's an accelerator, it's a driver, it's a tool. And this is something that we can use. I think that the low hanging fruits would be to work, to collaborate. What I found most important is collaborating with partners, private sector, NGOs, development partners, all students, uh, uh, faith-based institutions, all around the country. And we would play this thing. We would play our classes and the children would listen. We would develop, we would work with institutions like, there are institutions like teaching at the right level. Teaching at the right level means that you, 
if a child is reading at primary two level, that is 10 or, or, or five, you put them together and you have a way of teaching them so that they come up to their right level. In part two after the break is more on education as the National Universities Commission calls for increased integration of technology into the nation's university system to boost industry university partnerships. We we'll have that story and more in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, you're watching the News at 10, coming to you live from Channel's television. Here's a reminder of our top stories. Police in Ebony State arrest suspects over attacks on their stations and parts of the state capital on Tuesday to enforce a sit-at-home order by pro-Biafra agitators. Former Governor of Zamfara State defends his proposal to the President to explore dialogue with bandits in resolving insecurity in the Northwest. Arewa Youth Leader says Senator Arima's suggestion is faulty. Supreme Court nullifies conviction of Senator Peter Amobushi and his seven-year jail term for 800 million naira fraud orders his immediate release from the Correctional Center. And United States announces plans to send cluster munitions package to Ukraine to boost the country's counteroffensive against Russia. The National Universities Commission, NUC, is advocating the integration of technology into the delivery of university education to ensure its resilience in a post-COVID-19 world. Acting Executive Secretary of the NUC, Mr. Chris Mayaki, made the suggestion in Abuja at the third annual conference of the Forum for Innovation in African Universities. He says that by harnessing the power of innovation, the institutions can foster sustainable industry, university industry partnerships that transcend traditional boundaries. And back to security, where well, the former governor of Zamfara State, Sani Arima, has reiterated his position that the only way out of the present insecurity in the north is for the government to negotiate with bandits. According to him, negotiation with armed group is an international practice in ending insecurity. He was a guest on our political program, Politics Today. Any act of criminality is the same. You know, but the approach that you have to adopt, like I said, is stick carrot and stick approach. While we are doing the military operations, that's what I mean, we now, all those who are ready to give up their arms and come to negotiate mm -hmm. on the negotiation table, because state government, some state government try to do that, but they don't have the capacity to do it. You know, the resources they need to do that, they don't have it. They cannot. This problem has been there for a very long time as the military and other security agencies have been working to solve the problem, and it is only increasing. And I believe that, uh, like I said, because of the high level of poverty we have in the north, this problem will continue, because they will, increase, they will continue to recruit people. And, but I am sure with the new agenda of Mr. President, they need hope. Whenever you look at that document, it has a lot of provision for agricultural production, increased production, financial, I mean, fiscal and monetary policies that will change the entire space of economic system of Nigeria. I'm sure by that time, by the time we start negotiating with them and bringing them into this cycle of uh, development policy of the president, uh, things will change. Some of them will give up, and the others who are not ready to give up their, uh, I mean, criminality, criminal activities, they will, they will face the wrath of uh, the military. See, you need to settle them, build, you know, schools for them. These people, most of them are herders, and they don't have any animal today. Most of them are planners. They are herders. If this issue has not been addressed by government, if this is not addressed by government, I don't think this problem will end. 
Meanwhile, the Arawa Youth Consultative Forum has faulted the former governor of Zamfir State, Ahmed Yurima, for asking the federal government to negotiate and grant amnesty to bandits who have been terrorizing residents in the northwest region. President of the forum, Mr. Yurima Shatima, is urging President Tunubu to ignore such advice but should sustain military action against the terrorists. And it is just nothing but criminality. It's a criminal act, uh, quite different, because the idea of the bandits and the kidnapping and so on was not built on ideology. So the struggle is not just about an ideological struggle, just like the case of insurgency or talk of this experience we had in the Northeast, that to an extent, even for me, I did not even see it necessary to even dialogue with the terrorists. Uh, or the insurgency or whatever group you call it. But the case of Bandi that he specifically made mention of that we are faced with in the in the northwest area, specifically Kaduna and other neighborhood states, I do not think uh, it is a good idea to even dialogue or to even give them a face to sit down and deliberate anything. They should be treated as criminals and as such they should be dealt with decisively. The present governors will have to build synergy within themselves. The governors will have to come together and agree and come up with a common program on the issue of insecurity because injury to one has, is an injury to all. Some might be danger or some cannot be compared with other areas. But in this case now, because the moment you attack one, they will go to B, C, D, E, F. At the end of the day, they will get everybody across. So to that extent, if we are truly all out to address the issue, the governors will have to sit down and marshal out plans so that all of them can work together, collaborate, and let the federal government also join them to ensure that this thing is being tackled because on their own they cannot do it and i emphasize on that again the federal government must have to be part and parcel of this program all the way from security in the northwest the president will tomorrow depart abuja to attend the 63rd ordinary session of the authority of heads of state and government of the economic community of west african states ECOWAS in Bissau, capital of Guinea-Bissau. This is according to a statement by the President's Special Advisor on Special Duties, Communications and Strategy, Ms. Adelia Lake. The summit is President Tunibu's first ECOWAS engagement since he came on board as Nigeria's President on May the 29th. The summit, which is slated for Sunday, is expected to address, among other things, memoranda on pressing sub-regional issues, including a report of the 50th Ordinary Session of the Mediation and Security Council covering security challenges faced by member countries, a report of the 90th Ordinary Session of ECOWAS Council of Ministers on the financial situation of the body and the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA. Let's head to Abuja for more stories. Terry Kumi is waiting. Hi, Terry. Hello, Millicent. Players in the nation's power sector are kicking against what they say is the plan by the federal government to use a World Bank loan of $155 million for the importation of electricity meters into the country. Local manufacturers under the aegis of Association of Meter Manufacturers and Assemblers of Nigeria, Amon, told journalists in Abuja that the transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, is about to open tenders for the project and urge the federal government to urgently step in. According to the group, the move will cripple local businesses as well as lead to job losses. We cannot sit by and watch our investments collapse. We have a responsibility to our staff, our employed staff. We have a responsibility, you know, to, to try and keep uh, what our import our contribution to the GDP should be because in this industry direct investment direct employment is nothing less than 10 15,000 and indirect employment because when we produce meters we have installers each company has a myriad of installers from a hundred to 200 250 installers working for them in some large states you have even more installers and plus the the fact that for each factory that is operating there are people who cook there are transporters who move our equipment and our and our products 
there are what you call the multiplier effects. Now, as part of its digital policy drive, the Edo state government has launched a platform which is expected to provide a seamless connection between government and the private sector. Governor Godwin Obasaki explained that the platform will drive efforts to improve data collection as well as allow government to supervise the digital space in the state. He stated this at the government house when he met with the technical partners on the project. So, if we're making internet available, if we're building up uh, fiber optic connectivity, if we're connecting our local governments, if, if, if we blanket the space with digital infrastructure and systems, what is, on what basis are we going to operate? So that's why I'm quite excited. Uh, today, we we'll jumped ahead, as usual, you come um, with one of your grant team partners, NESG, to help us think through this digital world we're creating in Edo. What is it going to rest on? What are the policies guiding what we're doing? What are we doing that? It has to be simple. So that kid who is sitting somewhere in the evening and wants to go online, design a software, or, you know, internet, understands that these are the rules. It has to be simple. Because as long as you have a device and as long as you are in that space, then you must understand we must all agree that this is how we are going to be operating within that space. Well, still to come on the news at 10, the president sets up Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms in a bid to remove all barriers impeding business growth in the country. That's on Business News. Just stay with us. Welcome back to the news at 10. The managing director of the Niger Delta Development Commission, Mr. Samo Buku, is optimistic that the interventionist agency will be repositioned to deliver on its mandate. According to him, the commission is not a failed agency as widely perceived and it is ready to correct the mistakes of the past. Mr. Obuku made the assertion at a policy dialogue with development partners in the nation's capital. It's a gathering of critical stakeholders, drawn from different sectors of the economy, passionate about the development of the Niger Delta. The Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, is seeking collaborations with donor and development partners in order to chart a course for addressing the varying issues plaguing the region. If you're doing business in Nigeria and the Niger Delta is not peaceful, then that means it's like shooting yourself on the feet because the Niger Delta guarantees the prosperity of this country. So we all have to make it as a collective effort to ensure that the Niger Delta is also very, very peaceful. And what brings about that peace is when there is prosperity, when there is youth employment. This meeting, therefore, presents another opportunity for our stakeholders and development partners to assist us on the best mechanism to be evolved and adopted at ending the unkind narrative in order to continue to jointly develop the Niger Delta region. The Commission is looking towards legacy projects that can impact directly on the living condition of the people, including the NDDC East-West Road Coastal Road project. The Niger Delta Regional Power Pool project we intend to build because the importance of power, energy, we cannot overemphasize that. As a matter of fact, there is a direct correlation between power and insecurity. You see, if the power is expensive and it's not available, industries cannot grow. So if we can provide cheap power to the region, we believe that will drive industrial growth. And if, in, if industries are abound all over the place, unemployment will reduce, quality of life will improve. The development partners say a few words with the promise of collaboration. The NDDC management says it's rolled out a mechanism for transparent mobilization and management of partner resources so that investment from development partners can be scaled up to continue to improve the environment and livelihoods of the people of the region. Victoria Longjun, Channels Television News. That's all from the nation's capital, Millicent.
Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks, Terry. Do enjoy your evening. Well, we continue here, and this is in a couple of weeks. The measures agreed upon between the federal government and organized labor, as well as other stakeholders in the oil and gas industry, to cushion the impact of fuel subsidy removal are expected to reach implementation stage. While citizens await the next line of action, some economists have been suggesting ways the federal government can make the most impact through the palliatives. Now, our business correspondent, Ini John Mekwa, has more. The average cost of filling a car is now about 20,000 naira, about double of what it used to be before petrol subsidy was removed. Public transport fare reflects this. Routes intra legal states such as Berger to Marina now cost 400 naira from 200 naira and that's under government mass transit. Lagos to Asaba is now 38,000 naira from about 20,000 naira. Lagos to Yola is now about 25,000 naira from 18,000 naira and Yola to Abuja is now 15,000 naira from 7,000 naira. Same applies to keeping generators operational, a necessity in the face of poor electricity supply from the national grid. Small business owners attest to this. Demands have reduced. If you want to make gain of 500 naira, maybe at the end of the business, you sell three or four items and make one five as your gain. The federal government is not unaware of these consequences of what many economists have termed a necessary hard decision of ending the petrol subsidy regime. So what I will say the immediate impact is an escalation in the cost of doing business, that's for businesses, and especially those whose operations depend largely on petrol, what they call PMS. So and even if it is petrol dependent, that cost could spike maybe between 15 and 70 percent in the sense that the smaller an enterprise is, the greater most likely will be the impact. We now come to individuals and households, as we call them in economics. By all means, again, the cost of living will escalate. And of course, this will fall in terms of what they spend most of their money on. Consequently, President Bola Tinubu has charged the newly inaugurated National Economic Council, led by the Vice President, to draw up workable plans that will ameliorate the harsh impact of the subsidy removal. There's also another group made up of trade unions and government representatives which has been meeting to initiate and implement palliatives for the same purpose. The group is working with a deadline of eight weeks from June the 19th. The demands of the Trade Union Congress include minimum wage should be increased from the current 30,000 naira to 200,000 naira, setting up of intervention fund where governments will be paying 10 naira per litre on all locally consumed PMS. Federal government should provide mass transit vehicles for all categories of the populace. Provision of subsidy directly for food items. We need to have a presidential steering committee that will oversee everything. Then we also need to have technical subcommittees because, for example, when you talk about the issue of CNG, so the issue of CNG, you need experts. The issue of CNG, you need those people that are willing to invest in the issue of CNG. You need the National Air Company, NMPC Limited, uh, to come up with what they need to do and the time with which they are going to deliver. In the meantime, economists have been sharing suggestions of what they believe are low-hanging fruits. Government cannot say we are not going to collect taxes uh, because taxes is, is a primary way of also uh, getting revenue. But they could have something like a tax break. And, and for you to have a tax break, you have to be registered. So if I run a company today and I say I want to take part in this palliative process, then I need to register. If I register, let's say over the next six months or so, whilst we are struggling and making things to, to balance, then government can give me some tax concessions. States have also been drawn into the need to provide succor for their residents. 
Edo and Kwara state governments have reduced working days in their states to free to reduce transportation costs for individuals. While for Ogun state governor, there is a committee that's saddled with this responsibility. There's no doubt that as government, it will be very ambitious for us to even begin to imagine that we will have a solution that would totally um, compensate 100% for this price differential. Whatever options that we agree on would only go a long way into reducing the impact, um, not totally eliminating it. It's over a month since the new price of petrol has been affected and subsidy regime ended. Nigerians are eagerly waiting for the proposed palliatives to be affected to buffer the aftermath. In John Mekwa, Channels Television News. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. On business news, we begin with some company news. Mota Angel Nigeria Limited has taken delivery of its heavy-duty equipment that's worth over $200 million in Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. Taking delivery of the equipment, the company's logistics manager said this latest acquisition is a strategic investment for the present and the future. Among its many projects in Nigeria, Mota Angel is constructing the $1.959 billion Kano Maradi Standard Gauge Railway Lines, the Shagamo Benin Expressway, the Lagos Padagri Expressway, and is the reserved bidder for the fourth mainland bridge in Lagos. Brand new trucks, earth moving machines, truck mounted mixer truck, and several other still in the vessel arrived here at the Tinkan Port in Lagos. Motor NGO Nigeria Limited is behind this massive investment in construction equipment into Nigeria. With origins in Africa, the company, which was founded in 1946, wants to make and retain a big presence in Nigeria. What a way to start for Morton Gil, the preferred bidder and winner of the Kano Maradi rail project, just as these equipment will be making their way to a site for the 390-kilometer railway line construction. It's not only one of the biggest shipments that was made uh, by Martin Gil, but also one of the biggest shipments into machineries to arrive in, in Nigeria. Uh, first and, and second, we have a lot of expertise, manpower that have... Uh, uh, extensive experience in, in civil engineering. We already did a railway in Malawi and we did there uh, around 100 kilometers of railway. We are not active only with railway but with roads, with uh, dams, with uh, civil construction. So we basically tick all the, all the areas of, of civil engineering. For the road projects, Morten Gil says it has also won the concession and expansion of Lagos to Badagri Expressway a 140-kilometer road with a $240 million investment. Uh, besides that, uh, we have a lot of other projects in the pipeline. We're also the runners-up for the fourth uh, mainland bridge. Okay, so we are not the first but the second, so we're there if need be. And uh, we, it's a, uh, I can see this, uh, this country, uh, it's the biggest economy in Africa. And I can see lots, lots of potential uh, investments and, and that we can do here. According to the company's officials, 80 tipper trucks, 90 earth moving machines, wheel loaders, backhaul loaders, 
crawler excavators, motor graders, pneumatic rollers, mobile cranes, and many more are some of the equipment already brought in for works in Nigeria, with several more to come. To all the stories, President Bola Tinubu has approved the establishment of a presidential committee on fiscal policy and tax reforms as part of efforts to remove all barriers impeding business growth in the country. In a statement released today, the Special Advisor on Revenue, Mr. Adelabu Adediji, outlined the key challenges in Nigeria's tax system to include multiple taxes and revenue collection agencies, high prevalence of tax evasion, poor accountability in tax revenue utilization, among others. Ms. Adeniji also mentioned that the president has named Mr. Taiwo Yedili, a fiscal policy partner and Africa tax leader at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, as the chairman of the committee. He added that the government aims to transform the country's tax system to support sustainable development and achieve a minimum of 18% tax-to-GDP ratio within the next three years without stifling investment or economic growth. The central bank has warned money deposit bank, and that is money banks and other financial institutions in the country, to be wary of business transactions with individuals in Cameroon, Vietnam and Croatia. In a statement released on its website, the financial market regulator says the decision was arrived at based on Financial Action Task Force meeting conducted in June 2023, which listed the three countries' bank accounts as unsafe, high risk and must be in monitored. The task force, which is a global anti-money laundry, uh, laundry watchdog in February this year, included Nigeria and South Africa on its grey list of countries that are subject to enhanced monitoring. And back home we head to the stock market, which ends the first week of July with impressive gains as the all share index soared above 63% points. Will it bang? Welcome to the Stock Market Report. It's been back-to-back -back hits at the NGX, and it's not stopping there. I think the NGX is about to make history. All key indexes were on a bullish run today. Banking sector is up today more than 3.3%. And this is thanks to FBN Holdings, Access Holdings, GTCO. I should just stop counting and just say the Fugas and other banking stocks. Now, Dangoli Cement was largely responsible for the uptake in the industrial goods counter. It's gained 10 Naira today. And MRS's 8 Naira 20 cobble gain was able to offset the loss in Adoba, pushing the oil and gas index further up by 1.06%. All this positive performance triggered the All Share Index to step it up a notch and cross into the 63,000 level. And that's not all. A 556 billion Naira gain ushered the market cap into the 34 trillion Naira mark. Whoa, what a day, what a market. <laughs> now let's zoom in on the activity chart. Total turnover, not bad at all, although lower numbers than what was recorded yesterday. Uh, sentiments in the market are still very strong. The market saw 66 stocks gain today with just 16 losers. It's been a good run for both investors and traders at the NGX, and we await the half year's earnings reports. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Will Ebon. <laughs> And away from business news, the United States is planning to send a cost of munitions package with failure rates lower than 2.35% to Ukraine to help in its counteroffensive against Russia. Though U.S. law prohibits the transfer of these munitions with bomblet failure rates higher than 1%, President Joe Biden has been able to bypass the hurdle. Cluster munitions have been banned by more than 100 countries. Here's Simon Pusey with other international stories and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Hundreds of people have attended a funeral procession held for two Palestinians killed by Israeli security forces suspected of carrying out a shooting attack against police earlier this week. The military said Israeli forces raided the occupied West Bank town of Nablus and both men were killed following an exchange of fire. 
Meanwhile, Israelis laid to rest a soldier shot by a Palestinian gunman near a settlement in the occupied West Bank. Shiloh Yosef Amir was killed in an attack the Hamas militant group said it carried out in response to a two-day raid this week in Jenin. The gunman fired at security forces who had stopped to inspect his vehicle near the Palestinian city of Nablus. The UN humanitarian coordinator in South Sudan has released $8 million for the humanitarian fund to provide life-saving assistance to the 150,000 people in the country who have fled the conflict in Sudan. The UN's Humanitarian Affairs Office has said the number of arrivals is projected to increase as the crisis continues. Onward transportation of South Sudanese returnees and Sudanese refugees from transit sites remains a significant challenge due to the combination of poor road infrastructure and insecurity in some areas. Police are continuing to question a woman over a car crash at a school which killed an eight-year-old girl as floral tributes are laid at the scene. Twelve people were taken to hospital after a Land Rover crashed into the study preparatory school in Wimbledon in London. The woman in her 40s remains in custody, having been arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. The force has said it is not treating the crash as terror-related. Heavy rainfall and flash flooding has hit Zaragoza in Spain, leaving streets flooded and vehicles stranded on roads. Video shared by an eyewitness showed water gushing rapidly on a road and partially submerging vehicles. An orange rain alert was issued, but the regional emergency services did not report any injuries or deaths. Heavy rain with hailstones was seen in another video from Zaragoza in northeast Spain. Police warned residents to avoid unnecessary travel and not to drive through flooded areas. Vai trazer um resultado que, no meu entendimento... The Brazilian government says deforestation in the Amazon rainforest fell by 33.6% in the first six months of President Lula da Silva's term, compared with the same period the year before. The released government satellite data has not been independently verified. Lula has pledged to end deforestation or forest clearance by 2030. Twitter is considering legal action against Meta over its fast-growing rival Threads. The app, which launched to millions on Wednesday, is similar to Twitter and has been pitched by Meta bosses as a friendly alternative. Twitter's Elon Musk said competition is fine, cheating is not. But Meta denied the claims that in a legal letter were made that ex-Twitter staff had helped create threads. According to Meta, more than 30 million people have signed up for the new app seems very timely and I'm sure they've been working on it for quite some time but this was a uh, perfect timing uh, with just the recent the latest uh, sort of little fiasco on Twitter with uh, Musk rate limiting users and and all that stuff so yeah the timing was perfect and so it's not too much of a surprise they have very intelligently recognized that they can port over essentially shift over existing Instagram users to this new service right this new uh, application and that's quite intelligent because basically the networks we already have and those we already follow or engage with on a platform like Instagram can be quickly you know brought into bear rather than having to create a so-called ecosystem of users from the start and a drone flight shortly after daybreak has given a rare glimpse of the sights of London that the statue of Lord Horatio Nelson looks out on every day the statue of Nelson, commemorated for his 1805 victory against the French and Spanish fleets at the Battle of Trafalgar, sits atop a column in central London, his head some 51 metres above street level. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. Welcome to Sports News. Heartland Football Club of Owerri are the 2022-23 Nigerian National League season champions. The Owerri Bays team beat Kano Pillars in the final of the NNL Super 8 playoffs at the Stephen Kesha Stadium, Asaba, earlier this evening. The Owerri club finished the competition unbeaten. In Lagos, Roma Stars of Ikenna beat MPFL champions Ayimba of about 2-1 in the opening match of the Niger Super 8 at the Mobolaji Johnson Arena Onikon earlier this evening. Chiso Mokeke and Shion Ogurogwe got the vital win. 
the Sky Blue, for the Sky Blues to take them up on the top of a Group A. Well, on Saturday, Aqua United will take on the Obey Desert Stars, while Rivers United will face Lobby Stars in the Group B opener. And that's Sports News. I'm Ayo Tunde. Balogun is back to you. Thanks, Ayotunde. And the main news again. The police in Eboin State today arrested persons suspected to have carried out attacks on their stations and parts of the state capital on Tuesday to enforce a sit-at-home order by pro-Biafra agitators. Also today, the Supreme Court nullified the conviction of Senator Peter Mubushi and his seven-year jail term for 800 million naira fraud ordered his immediate release from the correctional centre where he was being held. And that's your news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. Do have a great weekend. I'm Millicent Walker. Bye.